Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambudasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambudasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambudasa Homage to him, the Blessed One, the Worthy One, the Fully Enlightened One, I pay tribute to him. So I welcome you if you are new in the class. This is going to be fun. Maybe we'll get some people who haven't been in before. This should be uh, interesting. And so um, a lot of this is just listening, but I wish that you would, uh, you know, have questions if you like as we go along. And I'll try to give you a picture of what we're going to cover so you can tell as many people as you as you can, because I don't usually do this this way. And uh, it was requested and I thought, well, why not? Why not do it? Because because you're not, you're not really, um, you can hang out with me, okay, but it's kind of hard to hang out with Bonte right now with him in America. And so as many people as possible, I, I hope we get more and more people because this really makes the Dhamma come alive. This really does. When you know uh, you something about the different people that are involved in it from the beginning. Now, the way this is set up, there was basically the wheel turning sermon was the first one, the Dhammachaka Sutta, and then the second the second sutta that happened, the second sermon was a Nata Lakana about Anatta. Anata. And we're not going to go into the parts of that because later on as we go along, if we want to keep going, we would get to a part after we go through all the people that we we fished out here for you. Um, after that, we would go into, if we kept going, uh, the story of certain um, charismatic figures like Angulimala, the whole story. And we would also go into looking at the Buddha's routine on a daily basis. And uh, at that point, we get to uh, the Buddha's, uh, the Buddha's Paranibbana, but I don't know if we're going to go into that or not. But I'm going to tell you who we're going to be talking about. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about what happened after the uh, Anatalakana Sutta was he began to teach. And when he began to teach, uh, there were the conversion of various people as he went along, and you'll hear about how that happened. And then um, you'll hear about how he sent some people out to spread the word, the messengers of truth, the first group of messengers of truth, and how the Sangha was actually founded, the founding of the order, when that happened. And then the conversion, there was a conversion that occurred of 30 young men that occurred. And then we talk about the Kasapa brothers. And Kasapa comes up a lot when you're listening to the suttas. If, uh, if for instance, the Buddha says something to some of the monks and it isn't understood, you usually hear about Kohita explaining it or you hear about Kasapa. And then, um, then we go into um, the story of Sariputta and Moggallana, which is very special because those are the two chief disciples. And how exactly did that happen? And it's a really nice story. And that's the end of tonight, if we get that far. If it's too much, we just slow down and divide it up a little bit more, okay? What I'm using as a source uh, for this tonight is I'm, I'm basing a lot of what I'm drawing from is what I've been told, and also the Buddha and his teachings. We're going to use Narada's book. It's not a good picture of it, I guess, like that. But this is Narada's book, and you can get this online. Um, Narada, uh, it was done through the, um, the corporate body, Buddhist Educational Foundation in Taiwan, which is a big one. And um, there's a place that you can go online. You can find it. And you can probably, there might even be a PDF of this book. I'm not for sure, but there might be because it's a standard type thing. So here we go. The first one is the teaching of the Dhamma. 
Happy is the birth of the telephone. Just a second. <laughs> we got to turn the phone off right now. Um, wait a second. I should be ashamed of myself. I didn't turn the phone off. <laughs> wait a second. Uh, here. That's it. That's the end of it. Okay. So this is the teaching of the Dhamma. Happy is the birth of Buddhas. Happy is the teaching of the sublime Dhamma. Happy is the unity of the Sangha. Happy is the discipline of the united ones who lived in peace and harmony. These are the ones that lived like uh, milk blending in water. Didn't they got along? There were no disputes. This is what they were discovering that life could be like that. In a way, they were discovering heaven or hell can be on earth every day of your life. It's how your perspective looks at everything. Isn't that true? And that's part of a not to perspective is not taking things personally and not getting stressed out. So the first story is the conversion of Yasa, Y-A-S-A, -A, and his friends. In Benares, there was a millionaire's son. His name was Yasa, who led a luxurious life. And one morning, he rose early, and to his utter disgust, he saw his female attendants and mus musicians asleep in repulsive attitudes around him. The whole spectacle was so disheartening, disgusting, that the palace presented the gloomy appearance of a charnel house. Realizing the vanities of worldly life, he stole away from home, saying, distressed am I, oppressed am I. And he went in the direction of Isipatana, where the Buddha was temporarily residing after having made the five bhikkhus attain to arahatship. At that particular time, the Buddha, as usual, he was pacing up and down in an open space, seeing him coming from afar. The Buddha came out of his ambulatory, this exercise, and he sat on a prepared seat. This event all took place on the fifth day after the delivery of the sermon when all of the five bhikkhus had attained to our hotship. Not far from him stood Yasa, crying, oh, distressed am I, oppressed am I. And thereupon the Buddha said, here there is no distress, oh Yasa. Here there is no oppression, Oh, Yasa, come hither. Yasa, take a seat, and I shall expound the Dhamma to you. The distressed Yasa, he was pleased to hear the encouraging words of the Buddha. And removing his golden sandals, he approached the Buddha, respectfully saluted him, and he sat down on one side. The Buddha expounded the doctrine to him, and so he attained first stage of sainthood, Sotapada. Now, this is true that you can hear the Dhamma, which is the Buddhist words, the actual suttas, and a person can just burst through and attain to the level of Sotapada or Sakadagami. It's written that this can happen when a person is listening to the Dhamma. But when we're listening to only words like I'm saying now, instead of reading the suttas to them, 
we don't see it happen so much anymore, do we? So the problem is the statement actually pertained to the actual teachings of the Dhamma. And then what was happening as it happened back then, listening the same way as they did back then, then it happens sometimes. At first, the Buddha spoke to him on generosity, dana, morality, the sila, celestial states, saga, the evils of sensual pleasures, kama dinava, the blessings of renunciation, nekamam manasamsa, that's the giving up of the life and the things we want to acquire, stepping away. When he found that his mind was pliable and was ready to appreciate the deeper teaching, he taught the Four Noble Truths. Yasa's mother was the first to notice the absence of her son. She reported the matter to her husband. The millionaire immediately dispatched his horsemen in four directions, and he himself went towards Isipatana, following the imprint of the golden slippers. The Buddha saw him coming from afar by his psychic powers, and he willed that he should not be able to see his son. The millionaire approached the Buddha respectfully inquired whether he had seen his son, Yasa. Well, then sit down here, please, he said to his father. You would be able to see your son, said the Buddha. Pleased with the happy news he sat down, the Buddha delivered a discourse to him, and he was delighted, so delighted that he exclaimed, it is excellent, Lord. Oh, Lord, it is excellent. It is as if, Lord, a man were to set upright that which was overturned or were to reveal that which was hidden or were to point out the way to one who has gone astray or were to hold a lamp amidst the darkness so that those who have eyes may see. Even so, has the doctrine been expounded in various ways by the exalted one. I, Lord, take refuge in the Buddha, the doctrine and the order. May the Lord receive me as a follower who has taken refuge from this very day to my life's end, he said. He was the first lay follower Yasa's father, to seek refuge within the threefold formula. On hearing the discourse delivered to his father, Yasa attained arahatship. And thereupon, the Buddha withdrew his willpower so that Yasa's father may be able to see his son. The millionaire beheld his son and invited the Buddha and his disciples for alms on the following day. The Blessed One, he expressed his acceptance of the invitation by his silence. He nodded his head in silence. And after the departure of the millionaire, Yasa begged the Buddha to grant him the lesser and the higher ordination. Come, O bhikkhus, well taught is the doctrine. Lead the holy life to make a complete end of suffering. With these words, the Buddha conferred on him the higher ordination. Now, in the early days of the order, the higher ordination, the upasampada, literally with replete with the higher morality, was granted by simply saying these words. 
It was not complicated at all. The going forth or the renunciation is meant, it means the mere admission to the holy order by seeking refuge in the Buddha, Dhamma, and Sangha. The Upasampada is another step. Okay. With the venerable Yasa and a number of arahats increased to six. As invited, the Buddha visited the millionaire's house with his six disciples. These are the six principal disciples. Six of the 16 that you will hear about, I think, in this book, okay? And his former wife, Yasa's mother, and his former wife heard the doctrine expounded by the Buddha and having attained their first stage of sainthood, they became his first two lay followers. Now the Upasam, Upasaka is the male and Upasika is the female. And one who closely associates with the triple gem, these two terms are applied to the male and female lay followers of the Buddha. One becomes an Upasaka or Upasika immediately after taking the three refuges. Buddhang Sarananga Chami, I seek in refuge in the Buddha. Dhammang Sarananga Chami, I seek refuge in the doctrine. Sangang Sarananga Chami, I seek refuge in the order. This is the threefold formula called the Tiva Chitta, I'm sorry, Tiva Sika. Now, Venerable Yasa had four distinguished friends named Vimala, Subahu, Punaji, and Gavampati. Gavampati. When they heard that their noble friend shaved his hair and beard and donning the yellow robe entered the homeless life, they approached Venerable Yasa and expressed their desire to follow his example. Venerable Yasa introduced them to the Buddha. On hearing the Dhamma, they also attained arahatship. Keep account for me, okay? This is now up to 10. Arahats. 50 more worthy friends of Venerable Yasa, who belonged to leading families of various districts, also receiving instructions from the Buddha, attained arahatship and entered the holy order. Wow, Bhante. Now we've gone over 16. <laughs> I was hunting for the 16 earlier. So now we have what? We have 60. Hardly two months had elapsed since his enlightenment when the number of arahats rose to 60 and all of them came from distinguished families and were worthy sons of worthy fathers. The next part is the first messengers of truth. The Dhammadutta. The Buddha who before long succeeded in enlightening 60 disciples, decided to send them as messengers of truth to teach his new Dhamma to all without any distinction Everyone was allowed to come and listen to the whole story of the Dhamma. Before dispatching them in various directions, he exhorted them as follows. Freed am I, O bhikkhus, from all the bonds, whether divine or human. And you too, O bhikkhus, are freed from all bonds whether divine or human. Go forth, O bhikkhus, for the good of many, for the happiness of the many, out of compassion for the world. 
for the good benefit and happiness of gods and men. Let not two of you go by one way. Preach, O oh bhikkhus. The Dhamma, excellent in the beginning, excellent in the middle, excellent in the end. Both in the spirit and in the letter, proclaim the holy life, altogether perfect and pure. You note the reference to the gods here are the devas in one of the realms who protect the Buddha and who we can also come to hear and listen to. Now there are beings with little dust in their eyes who not hearing the Dhamma will fall away. There will be those who understand the Dhamma, too. I, too, O bhikkhus, will go to Uravela in Sananigama in order to preach the Dhamma. Hoist the flag of the sage. Preach the sublime Dhamma. Work for the good of others, you who have done your duties. The Buddha was thus the first religious teacher to send his enlightened ordained disciples to propagate this Dhamma out of compassion for others. With no permanent abode, alone and penniless, these first missionaries, they were expected to wander from place to place to teach the sublime Dhamma. Now they had no other material possessions, but their robes to cover themselves and an alms bowl to collect food. As the field was extensive and the workers were comparatively few, they were advised to undertake their missionary journeys alone. And as they were arahants, who were freed from all the sensual bonds, their chief and only object was to teach the Dhamma and proclaim the holy life, the brahmacharya. The original rule of the arahants who achieved their life's goal was to work for the moral upliftment of the people, both by example and by precept material development, though essential, was not their concern. I wanna tell you that the robes are for a lot more than just what it mentioned, covering you. They can have an umbrella, you know. Hold the umbrella and put part of a robe over your umbrella and you're sheltered from the sun and shaded well. Hmm? Protects you from the gadflies, protects you from the mosquitoes. And also when you practice metta, mosquitoes usually don't bite. They're too sweet. They're not wanting that. Founding of the order of the Sangha comes next. At that time, there were 60 Arahant disciples in the world. With these pure ones as the nucleus, the Buddha founded a celibate order, which was democratic in constitution and communistic in distribution. Now, we call it a benevolent dictatorship where you're listened to, your problems are listened to, and then the best solution is looked for and then determined, and then you follow that. It can be different in different places by whoever is at the front of the solution, the setup, but basically, is a form of kind of a uh, 
democrat they say democratic and constitution is true but communistic and distribution and there is a system that has been so well put together it has lasted over 2500 years my idea about that is don't tinker <laughs> if it works don't fix it so much you know the original members were drawn from the highest status of society were all educated and rich men, but the order was open to all worthy ones, irrespective of their caste, class, or rank. Both young and old belonging to all castes were freely admitted into the order and lived like brothers of the same family without any distinction. This noble order of the bhikkhus, which stands to this day, is the oldest historical body of celibates in the world. All were not expected to leave the household and enter the homeless life. As lay followers, too, they were able to lead a good life in accordance with the Dhamma and attain to sainthood. Venerable Yasa's parents and his former wife, for instance, were the foremost lay followers of the Buddha. All the three were sufficiently spiritually advanced to attain the first stage of sainthood. Now with the 60 Arahants and as ideal messengers of truth, the Buddha decided to propagate his sublime Dhamma purely by expounding the doctrine to those who wish to hear. The interesting thing is to examine the words propagate, promulgate, and proselytize in religion. Proselytize is persuasion to become whatever the person is talking about. Promulgation is to take care of and support the continuation of the original teaching as much as possible and help people to hear it. And to propagate is to go out and not be afraid, to go out and teach what it is you know. I was guarded very carefully when I first uh, came into this to promise a very high monk from uh, Nepal that I would never teach something that I did not understand. And we talked about that. And he said, it's a lot of that goes on. Instead of assuming that you know what something means, you need to go and find out and then experience it. And the Buddhist teaching was very special and very different at that time. He didn't come to the people as a guru and say, this is it exactly, and then you just go away. In fact, in some places, it's recorded that monks gave up and left because they didn't ask questions and they didn't pay attention to what he was actually teaching and they kept arguing about admonishment. There was no use and no progress and so they left. You come to learn the tranquil wisdom insight meditation. If you do that, the only way it will work the way we are explaining it to you is if you surrender to the instructions and no other instructions mixed in with it at all. It is a very delicate recipe like expensive French pastry in Paris. You can't get it like that in the rest of the world. It's so light and so delicate that if you change one ingredient, it will not work and progress. It is difficult to learn to teach it because you have to be able to catch where the person is going is falling off the track and you have 10 days to keep them on the track in a 10 day retreat. 
10 days you have with an interview each day to listen carefully. We only will use here in Asia. I hope that we can systematically use five questions and stay away from any more. As soon as I changed uh, a system from 12 questions to five questions a few days ago, the students started moving forward immediately. If the in interview gets too tangled up and a person has three chances to say what just happened, we don't get accurately enough information to catch quickly and know what to tell you to do to fix it so you're back on track very quickly. But if we keep you on track for 10 days, many lovely things can happen. Your mind can open up and you can really begin to understand what the Buddha meant by direct knowledge, knowing by seeing how everything works, discovering the origination, the disappearance, the gratification and how it occurs. The danger of gratification when we get involved with pleasurable things or into dislike about something. And the escape that the Buddha set forth to find and set up for daily day ways of escaping your routine types of suffering. It's marvelous, but you have to be willing to shift some of the ideas we have about meditation in order to make it really, really work. Meditation is not just for the retreat center. Meditation was for all the time. So many people came to him who were farmers from the villages. What did they take home that they were using every day that changed their personalities? What was it that actually shifted the way people treated each other to be kinder in many areas? What was it that affected the actual merchants and kings and military commanders to change their decisions? And this was a, a practice he was teaching for all humanity too. Although he was a leader, it's true, of a group. He was not only teaching Buddhists, was he? He was teaching anyone who wanted to listen. That's what's amazing, yeah? So here we go with the 60. Now all of a sudden there will be the conversion of 30 young men. The Buddha resided at Isipatana in Benares as long as he liked and went onward to Uruvela. On the way, he sat at the foot of a tree in a grove. At that time, 30 happy young men went with their wives to this particular grove to amuse themselves. And as one of them had no wife, he took with him a courtesan with him. And while they were enjoying themselves, this woman absconded with their valuables. The young men searched for her in the forest and seeing the Buddha inquired of him whether he saw the woman passing that way. What do you think, young men, is better, seeking a woman or seeking oneself? Questioned the Buddha. Seeking oneself is better, O oh Lord, replied the young men. Well then, sit down, and I shall preach the doctrine to you, said the Buddha. Very well, Lord, they replied, and respectfully they saluted the exalted one and sat expectantly by. They attentively listened to him and obtained the eye of truth. After that, they entered the order and received the higher ordination. So what is the eye of truth? Seeking one's self. This phrase is very significant. Atanam is the accusative of atta, which means self. And here the Buddha was not referring to any soul or spirit latent in a man, 
as some scholars attempt to show. How could the Buddha affirm the existence of a soul when he had clearly denied its existence in his second discourse? The Buddha has used this phrase exactly in the sense of seek thyself, look within. I'll add one, change your mind and you change your life. Conversion of the three Kasapa brothers comes next. Wandering from place to place, in due course, the Buddha arrived at Uruvela. Here lived three ascetics with matted hair known as Uruvela Kasapa, Nadi Kasapa, and Gaya Kasapa. They were all brothers living separately with 500, 300, and 200 disciples, respectively. The eldest was infatuated by his own spiritual attainments and laboring under a misconception that he was an arahant. The Buddha approached him first and sought his permission to spend the night in his fire chamber where dwelt a fierce serpent king. By his psychic powers, the Buddha subdued the serpent. This pleased Uravela Kasapa very much and he invited the Buddha to stay there as his guest. The Buddha was compelled to exhibit his psychic powers on several other occasions to impress the ascetic, but still he adhered to the belief that the Buddha was not an arahant as he was. Finally, the Buddha was able to convince him that he was an arahant. And thereupon he and his followers, they entered the order and obtained the higher ordination. His brothers and their followers also followed his example. Accompanied by the three Kasapa brothers and their thousand followers, the Buddha repaired to Gaya, Sisa, not far from Uruvela. Here he preached the Aditta Pariyaya Sutta, hearing which all attained arahatship. It gets exciting when you hear how one sutta can carry people into very deep states suddenly that you're going along in a retreat recently with 16 people. And when we did the Chichaka Sutta, we had Bhante recite it on a video. And then they went back to the Dhamma Hall and sat. The next day, there was this increase in over half of that group in time. He does this to people to watch certain suttas, to listen carefully. If you are listening, you are actually giving ear, leaving the past, the future concerns totally away, listening while you are sitting in a clear mind in the present time only there to hear Dhamma, nothing else. That's what's giving ear. And you walk through the pieces as in the Chichaka Sutta. If anyone says the I is self, that is not acceptable. The rise and fall of the I is seen and understood. And since its rise and fall are discerned, it would follow myself arises and falls. But that is why it is not acceptable for anyone to say the I is self, and thus the I is not self. And the forms are not self. And the consciousness is not self. And the contact is not self. And the feeling is not self. 
and the craving is not so interesting. If you went through all six of the pieces carefully, and when you listen to us read that to you, and you live it, one man, he came to Bunty afterwards back in 2005 with tears in his eyes. He said, there's nothing left but consciousness. If there's nothing left with consciousness, how can there be any weight on me at all? How can there be? And tears ran down his cheeks. He was listening with the right way. He was listening totally, living through each tiny step of that sutta, not with ditto marks, not with an out having the whole thing repeated. That's why the repetition is there. That's why we're impatient to listen to it today. But if you do quietly, you'd be amazed what can happen. Now we look Adita Pariyaya Sutta, the discourse on all in flames. All in flames, O oh bhikkhus. What? O oh, bhikkhus, is all in flames. I is in flames. Forms are in flames. I consciousness is in flames. I contact is in flames. Feeling which is pleasurable or painful or neither pleasurable nor painful arising from eye contact is in flames. By what is it kindled? by the flames of lust, hatred, ignorance, the birth, the decay, the death, the sorrow, the lamentation, the pain, the grief and despair, is it kindled? I declare to you, reflecting thus, O bhikkhus, the learned Arya disciple gets dispassionate with the eye, disenchanted with it, and the forms, the eye consciousness, the eye contact, whatever feeling pleasurable, painful, or neither pleasurable or painful, that arises from contact with the eye. He gets disenchanted with the ear, sounds, nose odors, tongue with its tastes and body with contact, mind with mental objects and thoughts, mind consciousness, mind contacts, whatever feeling, pleasurable, painful, or neither pleasurable nor painful, that arises from contact with the mind. And with dispassion, he gets detached, detached, he is delivered. He understands that birth is ended. Lived the holy life has been done and what should have been done is done. And there is no more coming into any state of being again. Then the Buddha concluded this discourse. All the bhikkhus attained arahatship. All of them eradicated all of the defilements. They let go. That's all. They had heard the Bhattakarata Sutta, which is taught later on to all of the monks. Let not the past grab hold of you. Let not the future worries take over your day. But stay in the present time is the message there. And only there is clear mind. Only there is the full potential of your brain. If you can just sit there for a day. You took the weight of the backpack of the past off your back. I didn't tell you to throw it away. I told you to hang it on the hook at the door at home when you went to work. I didn't tell you to throw the day pack away when you couldn't stand up and now you're leaning over 
because the day pack is full of the worries about the future, what might happen, what if this happens, what will I do? If you keep going like that, you're gonna have a stomach ache for lunch. But if you stay in that pure mind, like it's cradle for you for the day and you stay there, it's a pure mind place. Think of it, all the arahatship, eradicating all defilements. And now comes a check on the time. Dhamma Gavesi, what time is it? You know? Hmm? Anybody tell me. <laughs> tell me what time it is. We can decide if we're gonna do, sorry, Puta and Mogalana tonight. What time is it? I have no clock, you know. 7.20. It's 7.20? Okay. Yes. I think we can go through this. It's about four pages. We'll try. Okay. Conversion of Sariputta and Moggallana, the two chief disciples. It's important for you to learn this story. It's a wonderful story. <clears throat> now, not far from Rajagaha, in the village Upatisa, also known as Nalaka, there lived a very intelligent youth named Sariputta, the son of Sari. Since he belonged to the leading family of the village, he was also called Upatisa. Though nurtured in Brahmanism, <clears throat> his broad outlook on life and matured wisdom compelled him to renounce his ancestral religion for the more tolerant and scientific teachings of the Buddha Gautama. His brothers and sisters followed his noble example. His father, Vanganta, apparently adhered to the Brahmin faith. His mother, who was displeased with the son for having become a Buddhist, was converted to Buddhism by himself at the moment of his death. Upatisa was brought up in the lap of luxury. He found a very intimate friend in Kolita, also known as Mogalana. And with whom he was closely associated from a very remote past. One day, as both of them were enjoying a hilltop festival, they realized how vain, how transient were all sensual pleasures. Instantly, they decided to leave the world and seek the path of release. They wandered from place to place in quest of peace. These two young seekers went first to Sun Sanjaya, who had a large following and sought ordination under him. Before long, they acquired the meager knowledge which their master imparted to them, but dissatisfied with his teachings, as they could not find a remedy for the universal ailment which humanity is assailed by suffering. They left him and wandered hither and thither in search of peace. They approached many a famous Brahmin ascetic, but disappointment met them everywhere they went. Ultimately, they returned to their village and agreed amongst themselves that whoever would first discover the path should come and inform the other. This was at the time that the Buddha dispatched his first 60 disciples to proclaim the sublime Dhamma to the world. The Buddha himself proceeded towards Oruvela and the venerable Asaji, one of the first five disciples, he went in the direction of Rajagaha. 
Now the good karma of the seekers now intervened as if watching with sympathetic eyes their spiritual progress. For Upatisa, while wandering in the city of Rajagaha, casually met an ascetic whose venerable appearance and saintly deportment at once arrested his attention. This ascetic's eyes were lowly fixed, a yoke's distance from him, and his calm face betokened deep peace within him. With body well composed, robes neatly arranged, this venerable figure passed with measured steps from door to door, accepting the morsels of food which the charitable placed in his bowl. Never before have I seen, he thought to himself, an ascetic quite like this. Surely he must be one of those who has attained arahantship or one who is practicing the path leading to arahantship. How is it if I were to approach him and question him for whose sake, sire, have you retired from the world? He asked, who is your teacher? Whose doctrine do you profess? Upatisa, however, refrained from questioning him because he thought he would thereby interfere with his silent begging tour. The Arahant Asaji, having obtained what little he needed, was seeking a suitable place to eat his meal. And Upatisa, seeing this, gladly availed him of the opportunity to offer him his own stool and water from his own pot, fulfilling thus the preliminary duties of a pupil. He exchanged pleasant greetings with him and reverently he required, Venerable sir, calm and serene are your organs of sense. Clean and clear is the hue of your skin. For whose sake have you retired from the world? Who is your teacher? Whose doctrine do you profess? The unassuming Arahant Asaji modestly replied, as is the characteristic of all great men. I am still young in the order, brother. I am not able to expound the Dhamma to you at great length. I, I am uh, Upatisa, venerable sir. You may say much or little according to your ability, and it is left to me to understand it in a hundred or a thousand ways. Say little or much, tell me just the substance, just the substance only do I require. A mere jumble of words is of no avail to me, just the substance. Venerable Asaji uttered a four line stanza. Thus skillfully summing up the profound philosophy of the master on the truth of the law of cause and effect of things that proceed from a cause, their cause the Tathagata has told us and also their cessation thus teaches the great ascetic Godama. Upatisa was sufficiently enlightened to comprehend such a lofty teaching through succinctly, even though it was succinctly expressed just slightly but clearly. He was only in need of a slight indication to discover the truth. So well did the venerable Asaji guide him on his upward path that immediately on hearing the first two lines, he said, he attained the first stage of sainthood, Sotapati. 
the new convert Upatisa must have been no doubt destitute of words to thank to his heart's content, his venerable teacher for introducing him to the sublime teachings of the Buddha. He expressed his deep indebtedness for his brilliant exposition of the truth and obtaining from him the necessary particulars with regard to the master, he then took his leave. Now later, the devotion he showed towards his teacher was much that since he heard the Dhamma from the venerable Asaji, in whatever quarter he heard that his teacher was residing, in that direction he would extend his clasped hands in an attitude of reverent obeisance. And in that direction, he would turn his head when he lay down to sleep. Now, in accordance with the agreement, he returned to his companion, Kolita, to convey the joyful tidings. Kolita, who was as enlightened as his friend, also attained the first stage of sainthood on hearing the whole stanza from his friend. Overwhelmed with joy at their successful search after peace, as in duty bound, they went to meet their teacher, Sanjaya, with the object of converting him to this new doctrine. Frustrated in their attempt, Upatisa and Kalita, accompanied by many followers of Sanjaya, who readily joined them, repaired to Veluana Monastery to hear this illustrious teacher who was speaking, the Buddha. In compliance with their request, the Buddha admitted them, both of them, into the order by the mere utterance of the words, Etta Bikkhoe, come, O Bikkhus, for that was the way that you entered the Sangha in those days. A fortnight later, the venerable Sariputta attained arahatship on hearing the Buddha expound the Vedana Padagaha Sutta to the wandering ascetic Diganaka. On the very same day in the evening, the Buddha gathered round him his disciples and the exalted positions of the first and second disciples in the Sangha were respectively conferred upon the Teras, Upatisa, Sariputta, and Kolita, Mogalana, who also had attained arahatship in that week. The development of these two characters in the text, Venerable Sariputta became the foremost in wisdom. He also became the mother for all new monks who came. They were taught by him to practice to the fourth jhana in their meditation as they practiced dana. May suffering one be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief, and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty power share this merit of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sadu, sadu, sadu.